Uh, it's the best wife you ever had. It's the only wife you've ever had, too. We all know you made one great choice in life. You know, God's providence it was good to you. Uh, you know, and welcome to uh, any newcomers and those who have come back to us. Uh, and please continue to, you know, spread the word and and uh, invite people uh, to participate in this. Uh, we're almost finished with the Book of Wisdom. But let us uh, say a little prayer. And I'm going to go and use a prayer actually from the 13th century uh, as we continue to bask in the glow of uh, Pentecost and the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Truth was cross with me. Fear scolded me. Shame plagued me. Sorrow condemned me. Earning, yearning pulled me home then. Love led me. Trusting God shielded me. Pure intention in all things prepared me. And my good works all stood up and shouted. God's love made us. Mighty God, receive me then. God's pure humanity bounded itself to me, and His Holy Spirit cheered me up. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. From a very famous uh, uh, 13th century saint by the name of St. Mactilda. St. Mactilda of Magdenburg. So we have it uh, looking at the uh, in the book of wisdom as one of the hidden or secret books of the Bible because it falls in the, that the category of uh, apocrypha according to some and of course in the Catholic Bibles it's uh, very orthodox for us um, and working through an outline uh, this morning we're going to look at, on our outline, uh, Roman numeral 3, Wisdom's Teachings, Part D and E. And Part D indicates, and it talks, well, the heading is uh, the providence of God through the Exodus from chapters 11 through 19. And I'm going to begin by talking about something that I mentioned before here. Midrash. Midrash. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Go lie down and sleep in a patch of poison ivy. You wake up the next morning, you got midrash. <laughs> uh, comes from the Hebrew word uh, darash meaning to seek or to inquire. Uh, somewhat of a, a definition. It's a form, it was a form of biblical interpretation actually found later on. By later on, I mean in the area that uh, we call it A.D., uh, 1st, 2nd, 3rd century, uh, and onward, in rabbinical literature. A form of interpretation found during the era of rabbinical literature that was both exegetical and homiletic. Uh, exegetical means they, they were taking passages of what we call Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, and, and, and breaking it down, trying to get a deeper understanding. But also homiletic or the technical term is hermeneutical. Hermeneutical. You don't have to know that. But I, uh, I try to give you your money's worth, you know, throw all these 25 cent words every once in a while. Yeah. Yeah, Deacon Maury likes that. So, 
the chief purpose is to take a passage from a, an event or part of the law of Moses <coughs> and give that passage meaning to the contemporary generation of the Jewish community. It's not to discern the literal meaning, but rather to gain a new understanding in applying it to the contemporary situation, uh, culture, society that the Jews found themselves in. Okay? So, okay. <coughs> it's going on during Jesus' time. And particularly if you've gone to daily mass in the last couple of days, we've, we've had in the gospel reading, Jesus being confronted by Sadducees, by Pharisees and Herodians, by scribes, uh, trying to <coughs> challenge him for an interpretation of selected scripture passages and looking either to trap him before a crowd or to gain his perspective on that. <coughs> and, um, you know, for instance, <clears throat> a gospel passage that you could all relate to whether you went to Mass or not in the last couple of days. Uh, Sadducees came up to Jesus and they said, hey, Teacher, tell us, is it lawful to pay the tax to the, to the emperor or not? Loaded question. Okay? Uh, number one, because the Sadducees, they were the upper echelon, the wealthy uh, people uh, involved in the temple and, and so on, uh, at the Jewish community, uh, and they, they were, you know, working with the Sadducees. Uh, the Sadducees were working uh, with the Romans kind of hand in hand. Uh, so they had Roman coins. What was on every Roman coin? Caesar's image. Caesar's image. And that was a direct violation of the law of Moses, not to have any graven images, right? That's why Moses got so mad when he came down from the, you know, Mount Sinai and saw the golden calf being worshipped, huh? And then what did he do? He was the first man in history to break all Ten Commandments at once. <laughs> Throw him down, right? Okay, so I digress. I don't know why. Uh, so, the, uh, there's that prohibition. And so, what does Jesus do? He said, I don't have a coin. You have, does someone here have a coin? They produce the coin. And they're supposed to be religious leaders of the Israelites and so on. They said they had the denarii. And Jesus has a quip. Well, whose image is on there? And they said it's Caesar's. And what did he say? Okay, so another way to, to you know, understand what Jesus responded. Whose image is it? It's Caesar's. Oh, that must be Caesar's coin, so it better give it back to him but give back to God what is God's. So he takes what would be an entrapment given the contemporary socio-political situation for the Jews under subjugation of the Romans and really a point of contention in that society at that time and being confronted with that and what he does is put it in a, a larger context huh? and uh, turns it back to where it should be the focus on worshiping and give back to God what is God's right so <clears throat> that story actually represents a form of Christian Midrash, reinterpreting 
reinterpreting uh, faith, faith in one God, in a contemporary situation. We saw Jesus do that. That's why I'm citing this uh, now. In the section of wisdom, starting from chapter 11 through chapter 19, the focus of this section is on uh, uh, Exodus events. But the author is not <coughs> recounting the historical elements at all of the Exodus, but drawing from the experience of the Exodus events, the time the Israelites were formed in the desert with Moses, and interpreting them and that experience spiritually to the contemporary situation that the author and the Jewish community finds themselves in. And, you know, uh, I want to remind you that, so the author of wisdom, writing Uh, about 150 BC for our convenience uh, what you have is the Jewish community uh, <clears throat> being under under the influence and the guise of Greek Hellenistic culture. And the Jewish community, and where is it? It's in Alexandria, Egypt. So, Basically, the Jewish community, their beliefs in only one God, are, are being challenged, and many of the Jewish community are being drawn into the influence of that secular, Hellenistic culture and influence, and that was a challenge. And so, particularly in this passage, no, it's significant that in this passage, <coughs> in this part of the writing, the focus is on the Exodus event. And of course it's the Exodus event, and particularly what happened at Mount Sinai, with the giving of the covenant through Moses and the ritual that Moses directed by God uh, gave to them to renew that covenant that uh, they are uh, reminded here go back to your foundations go back to the foundations of what our people, our heritage, our tradition says over against what you're being taught right now by these Greek Hellenistic people, okay? Uh, and he's trying to basically show that the Jewish foundations are even more uh, faithful, uh, fundamental, higher level than anything they're being taught by the Greek and the Greek culture. So, two main points. Uh, found the sufferings that befell the Egyptians. Now he harkens back to that Exodus event and of course it's they they were Exodus from, the, they exited from subjugation of the Egyptians, right? So, He focuses a little bit on their uh, what befell the Egyptians as they left. 
Uh, it was because of the Egyptian sinfulness. Let's take a, a look at uh, chapter uh, chapter 12 of Wisdom. Uh, verses uh, verse 15 and 16. put 
that represented God. Stop to think. What animals did the ancient Egyptians depict, or what gods, or don't tell me gods, what animals did they use to depict different gods? Cats. Cats. And dogs. Dogs. Jackals. Birds. Birds. Crocodiles. Crocodiles. Huh? Lions. Beetles. Lions. <laughs> Snakes. Sun god, okay, that's that's not an animal, okay, but it's uh, something you know from the nature and so on. So you know the the Jews they see all these animal forms and so on, and they they just I, I, the author here is reminding his Jewish contemporaries those are animals, and yet you know we're surrounded with these forms. And, and they probably has statues and trinkets of that. That's why I said they form in gold and silver, a product of art, the likenesses of beasts. Okay? And so this is a biting commentary on the Egyptian cult being worshipped. Now you add to that, you superimpose on top of that, Greek mythology and the Greek gods and goddesses and so on and the hierarchy of the Greek pantheon now there the Greeks don't put their gods in, in, in animal form do they they put them in quasi human form huh? <clears throat> but in a hierarchical order and they assign them to the powers of nature in, in many cases uh, that can't be explained you know God of you know God of the sea is Poseidon, okay, um, and you know, the, you know, the, the goddess of love, Aphrodite, okay, uh, and the high god, yeah, and his spokesman that runs fast, huh? Mercury, okay, and and. and and, and the little flittering god with the little arrow. Okay. Okay, so, that, you know, that's, that's from Greek mythology. Now that's going on, influencing the Jewish community at the same time. So there's a whole section in here that kind of begins to take that apart, and especially in chapter 13. First thing, he talks about nature worship in the first part of chapter 13. And then the idolatry, and he talks about the carpenter making wooden idols and, and so on. Uh, that he says, you know, are basically, you know, worthless. Uh, they are, I mean, he recognizes the skill of the woodworkers and their art forms, but he doesn't, you know, equate that as they are doing with God. Uh, Alexandria, Egypt, of course, and in uh, verse uh, 14, he talks about uh, ocean voyages and, and so on. Uh, of course, it was a harbor town, wasn't it? It was so much of a harbor town that, that, that where is it now? <laughs> Underwater. Okay. Uh, but, and then the origin and evils of idolatry, you find in 14, starting with verse 12 and so on. And he, he just... He just goes and, and picks that apart. He also indicates uh, towards the end here uh, that the very elements that afflicted the Egyptians, and by that he's basically referring to, uh, you know, the plagues, uh, became the salvation for the Israelites. So the various things that afflicted the Egyptians that neither themselves or their gods or goddesses could hold back, represented by the ten plagues, without referencing the ten plagues, the plagues uh, became uh, the benefit for them. This is Midrash, okay, taking elements from the biblical past, the tradition of the Hebrew Israelite people, 
and reinterpreting it for another generation. And when you realize it was it was pretty complex because the influence of of this author's contemporaries, they're influenced not only by the old Egyptian culture and mythology, but now the Greek. You got two different elements of influence <laughs> trying to pull them away. Um, event, eventually, in this section, uh, what the author is stressing is God's wisdom, their God's wisdom, has guided the his, history of Israel in a providential way, even when the people of God were oppressed. God alone is the master of all. And when he says God alone, he's not talking about any one of the Egyptian or Greek gods. He's talking about the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of the Israelite people. God alone. Now, so, the next section I want to talk about a little bit is the theology and themes of the New Testament. So what is so unique about this book of wisdom? Well, one of the main, unique, probably overarching, unique features is the methodology that the author uses. The methodology, the literary methodology, from other societies. And sometimes they are forced to react. Okay. Now, we, we've studied a lot of the Old Testament over the years. Those who have been here. Okay. So, for instance, I, I want you to jog your memory a little bit. So, can you think of some biblical example Think of you know some of the either individuals or groups of individuals from the, the ancient Hebrews, uh, some biblical examples where they had to adapt, sometimes on the fly, to a conflict with a new culture that they encountered. Babylon. Babylon. Okay, when they went to Babylon. Okay, in in the exile. Earlier than that, all the, all the tribes they encountered into the Holy Land. Okay, when the tribes came and settled into the Promised Land, the Canaanites were there already. The Canaanites were there already. So, and and you know they had to, you know, deal with that. Even though the early uh, judges uh, or Joshua. It seems like the Israelites, they, they overpowered and, and wiped them all out and, and so on. Well, they really did. Okay. They, they found out it's better to make love than make war. So, yeah, they began to intermarry with the Canaanites. But then they caused the watering down of their, you know, traditions and so on. Anyone else can recall? Egypt. In Egypt? Yes. Uh, which specific example comes to mind? Joseph and Abraham were to go off to Egypt to survive. So, to survive, Joseph particularly, uh, uh, one of the sons 
um, uh, of Jacob. Uh, you know, he, he adopted Egyptian ways, didn't he? Shaved his head, just wore a little cloth. You know, probably got tattooed if they did that. You know, so much so, so much so that when his brothers came from Palestine. Because the family was under famine. They didn't recognize their brother Joseph, did they? Huh? They didn't recognize. So they were talking, to, you know, their Hebrew between themselves. And of course, Joseph, who was the Secretary of State or in charge of the Secretary of Agriculture that they're coming to get food from, you know, he understood what they were saying. But they thought it, that he was just an Egyptian, you know, that didn't know their language. So they rattled on, you know, and in Hebrew and he's taking it all in. It wasn't until <clears throat> he put them to the test. Huh? So yeah, that's another example. In order to survive. Yeah. But do we know or does it say he didn't give up, give up his base values to survive. He adapted but he re maintained within his own soul who he was or what he was. He did, he did, you know, and it always he got him killed initially, you know, by not succumbing to the possible uh, insult. Think of Father Abraham. Okay? Father Abraham twice passed his wife Sarah off as his sister. Remember that? Yeah. When we studied it? Twice he passed her and why did he do that? Well, as a traveling pastoralist, with his herds and his flocks and his, his entourage, okay, it was, if he passed her off as his wife and they didn't have any children, it would be real easy for the leaders of the societies they bumped into to take her out and then take all his possessions. To, for him to pass her off as his sister, then there's still the like the possibility that the other societies that they bumped into might say, "Oh, well, if we could, if we could have one of our sons marry his sister, then we might end up with all the stuff anyhow, and maybe he'll settle here, and we would become rich." You see, adapting on the fly, delete. Okay, the example is of Ruth, who who adopted his, her mother-in-law's religion and, and, and really went with her back to Palestine after Ruth's husband died, and then you know totally be you know adopted. So yeah, good example. I thank thank you for that. So you, you see, over and over again, judges, uh, Jacob. Jacob had to adapt to his greedy father-in-law Laban's customs. Okay. And he turned it around to get his own herd and flocks and so on, and then he got back out of there. Okay. Uh, Moses and the Egyptians. Uh, of course, he, he was plucked out of the river, wasn't he, Moses, and you know, raised up. And the judges and Canaanites, Joe pointed out to us, uh, during the age of, you know, and the Israelites with the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, now the Greeks, and even the Romans. Historical situations for the Hebrew people. Sometimes they were peaceful. Sometimes they were violent and destructive. But whatever the situation, the elements of those cultures that the religion of Israel bumped into, that the Hebrew people, God's people, bumped into, that um, each of those cultures found some ways to influence the traditions of Israel. Each of them influenced the traditions of Israel. Without Israel essentially compromising the you know, belief in only one God. During the first example that Patricia indicated to us over here was Babylonia. 
Well, the influence of the Babylonians on on the uh, Jewish culture uh, and subsequently, uh, well, probably one story that stands out even from the book of Genesis was the Tower of Babel. The step Tower of Babel going going up. That's you know. When they were in Babylon, they saw what was called the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, these step pyramids called ziggurats with gardens on each level and, and so on. So another wonder of the ancient world, yes. So, you know, that influence, that story. Uh, the influence of the Persians who conquered, who conquered the Babylonians and, and, and were friendly with the Jewish people, the influence that came into religion was in angels and demons. The old, you know, mythology if you want, or the concept of angels and demons entered the Jewish religion through the influence of the Persians. And specifically a religion that Persia had uh, 500 years before Christ, a religion that still exists yet today in northern Iran, Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism still exists. So now from Hellenism, I start by saying the methodology of the author of wisdom. What did he get from the Greeks? Well, what was attractive was elements of Hellenism such as reason, logic, rationalism. Re reason, logic, rationalism, organization, the listing of virtues, principles, the listing of virtues and principles, articulated philosophically, articulated philosophically. So some of the classical philosophic philosophical schools, if you will, or movements from Greece was present in Alexandria and Egypt at this time. Epicureans, Stoics, okay, uh, just to name a couple. And they at once threatened the Jewish faith and the traditions of the ancestors. Uh, but also, what this author of wisdom did was uh, he didn't try to reconcile Judaism to Hellenism, but he used, and here's the brilliant methodology, this is where the methodology comes in. He used the ideas and language and literary style of the Greek culture. He used the ideas, language, and literary style of Greek culture to demonstrate the higher excellence of the Jewish faith. So if, if you sit down this weekend and you read through chapter 11 through 19 here in this book, okay, and you're, you're going to find it, it might be confusing, you might have to read passages a couple of times. But the, what the author is doing is applying Greek words and so on. And here's another thing to keep in mind. The Greeks actually had an economy of verbiage. An economy of words. So, let me ask you this. How many of you are lectors at Max? Have been lectors at Max? Uh, quite a few, okay. When you have to read a, a letter from St. Paul's letter to whoever, yes. you have to practice. You have to practice. You have to read that over, right? Over and over to try to get the meaning across. I'll give you a tip. Watch the punctuations. And take little short you know, breaks at the punctuation. Why? Because one Greek word, you need five or six English words. Okay? One Greek word, five or six English, English words. Why? 
because the Greeks had more thought behind each of their words than we do today. No. And then what do we have today? People people who talk, especially young people, I don't know about you, have you noticed this young people, they, they talk so fast you don't even understand what they are saying and they're speaking English. I think we... I think it's English that they're coming out of their mouth. You, you go you go out to order and the waitress comes over and they, 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 today we have a for a special everything. I I tell waitresses, you gotta speak slower for us older people. I can't hear that quick. What did you say? Right? Is it just me, or do you run into that too? And I think I got pretty good hearing, actually. Okay. I don't have hearing aids. No, no, I no, my hearing is fine. Okay. Digress. Okay. So he uses the ideas, language, and literary style of Greek culture in order to demonstrate that. Their religion is higher. The challenge of the interpretation that to adapt and transfer a religious heritage originating in one culture context to another while defending the ancestral faith. The challenge of his interpretation was to adapt and transfer religious heritage that originated in one culture to another while still defending the ancestral faith. What we have here in this writer, the author of wisdom, and throughout this book of wisdom, he's basically what we call an apologist. He's defending the ancestral faith of the Hebrew people in words and ways and ideas of the culture that they're being influenced in. It's the same task that we have today. Okay. Our, our, our task today is also to be apologists. Uh, oftentimes confronted even in our own families to defend our ancestral faith and our beliefs when family members you know go off or if we encounter in our society people who are antagonistic towards uh, you know Christianity you know a couple of weeks ago, Paul Francis made a startling, startling statement. He said there are more Christians being martyred today than there were in the first centuries of the church. There's more Christians being martyred today than in the early centuries of the church. Now we know historically, when the Roman persecutions started around you know, 64 A.D., and going till 310, basically 250 years, there were 10 different waves of persecutions. And it's believed that over a million Christians lost their lives standing up for the faith just in those 10 waves of persecutions by the Roman emperors. Pope Francis says there are more martyrs today than there was back then. And uh, of course he has he has a lot more historical resources to look that up than we do. The whole Vatican Library. Okay. Which is probably greater than the Alexandrian Library was back then. Okay. But so therefore the posts of the 20th century, actually starting with Pope Paul VI, uh, 
reintroduce the idea of a new evangelization for our time. <coughs> so our call is to proclaim the Word of God. Proclaim the Word of God, Jesus Christ, uh, in a new way in the culture of our time. This has been the Syrian call of, of, our, of our popes. Most recent one is Pope, Pope Francis. Get your hands on or Google up his encyclical, The Joy of the Gospel. The Joy of the Gospel. And you can, he, he spells it out for you. You don't have to read the whole introduction. You know, you start on paragraph 106 and go to paragraph 129. And it's there that you find, uh, you know, the phrase that our our own bishop, uh, Rickon, is picking up and putting out to us. All of us by our baptism, Pope Francis writes in there, are called by our baptism to be missionary disciples of Christ. Missionary disciples of Christ in the world today. Uh, basically, the author of wisdom was doing the same thing as an apologist of, of the faith and calling upon the Jews and reminding the Jews that their their way was an even more excellent way. It, it found in their religion. Okay? Now, themes, new themes that came through the influence of the Greeks. I wanted to, to touch on, on this very quickly. And during this time period, and elements that are found in this book. So, uh, they accept, number one, the acceptability of an afterlife for humans. The acceptability of an afterlife for humans. Number two, the concept of a human soul. If you skim through the Book of Wisdom, you see the word soul quite a bit. This is almost like the first book of the Old Testament where you see the word soul understood, it's, and it actually comes from the Greek philosophy, uh, who was it? The Stoics. Stoicism emphasized the human soul. And that's the understanding that is found in here. Okay. Third, third is the idea, not only of an afterlife and a human soul, but eternal punishment or reward for the just, or the unjust. Eternal Punishment for the unjust, eternal reward for the just. So, and jog your memory, Greek philosophy. The souls of the unjust, where did they go? Hades, not hell, Hades. Okay, cross the river Styx. Okay, uh, Fourth is a day of judgment. A day of judgment where God alone will vindicate the just. And fifth, they added to the attributes of the Spirit of the Lord. Uh, again, the major, major understanding in uh, Stoic philosophy was the Spirit. Okay? Okay. Uh, so, New Testament authors follow the methodology of the author of wisdom. New Testament authors follow. They continue to reinterpret the Jewish tradition as applied to Jesus, understanding by faith that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah. Uh, and so, for instance, St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, you know, that Jesus the Christ is the not only the Son of God, but also the wisdom of God. And when St. Paul writes that in 1 Corinthians, also addressing a community that is highly influenced by Greek or Hellenistic society, uh, St. Paul is using terms that his audience would understand, but also he's hearkening back, he's keeping in this tradition of the author of wisdom. The Gospel of John, for instance, 
right from the beginning. Jesus is depicted in ways that wisdom would have described. Okay? Almost all of you are old enough to remember. Well, maybe something. You know, the last gospel in the old Latin Mass, the reading from the beginning of John, in the beginning was the and the word was and the word was with God. Okay, right? Well, the term in Greek for word was logos. And it was a Greek philosophical term. And so, the Gospel of John begins by employing this methodology from the beginning using Greek terminology and adapting it and translating it into Christian theology. And specifically, right from the beginning of his gospel, the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Uh, he, he's setting the theme for his gospel of the identity of Christ, which means he's giving us uh, an introduction to what scholars call Joel 9 Christology, right from the beginning. So, uh, all, all of this was, uh, you know, to uh, indicate the methodology and the main themes. The themes that were written maybe 150 or 200 years before the New Testament writings, but the New Testament authors also seem to imply or apply the same methodology in their writing, adapting from the Greco-Roman culture that influenced them and actually persecuted that, them by the end, uh, but in order to get across the faith that we call the, the in early Christian evangelization, the kerygma. Okay. And we studied the Kerygma when we did a couple of years ago when we looked at biblical evangelization, right? In the speeches of, of St. Peter, the first speeches in the Acts of the Apostles, that Christ uh, was crucified, died, and was buried. He rose from the dead, and that's now seated at the right hand of the Father. And he died on the cross to save us from our sins. They were witnesses to it. We are called to be witnesses today as part of the new evangelization. Thank you very much for coming, everyone.